And so I'm, I'm trying to give him this rousing speech of, oh, well, you, you got to have faith in your equipment, private. You know, we've, we have this special equipment and, and faith in your training. We've got, we've been working with you and we've been doing this for everybody else. Faith in yourself, you know, thousands and thousands of people have done this before you. Uh, but at the end of the day, have faith in us. We, you know, we are your family and we're going to make sure that you're squared away and, and you're safe and that you do this. And it, he looks up with tears in his eyes and he says, I've never had a family. This month, Logan Phillips joins us on Insightful Inquiries. Logan Phillips is a world-class leader development expert. He is a U.S. Army officer, former basic training commander, assistant professor at the United States Military Academy, and award-winning author. Having spent over a decade shaping the next generation of military leaders, Logan now leverages his wealth of experience to bring these lessons to a broader audience, imparting invaluable leadership principles to individuals and organizations worldwide. In his groundbreaking new work, Number Your Stories and Lead Like a Legend, Logan captivates readers with incredible thought-provoking tales as he shares vital lessons on leadership and growth. Logan is also a nuclear physicist with degrees from West Point and Yale University and was named the winner of the Teaching Excellence Award for 2021. During his free time, Logan coaches his boys' football team and writes children's literature. His acclaimed children's book, I Love You More, donates 100% of proceeds to Gold Star Children, kids who lost their parents in the defense of the nation. Kervin and Logan discuss topics such as leadership, basic training, and the potential of overcoming past trauma to create a positive influence on others. My bulky blender was such a pain to use, I ended up hardly ever using it at all. But the Blendjet 2 Portable Blender makes blending so easy and convenient, I use it just about every day. Blendjet 2 is portable, so you can blend up a smoothie at work, a protein shake at the gym, or even a margarita on the beach. It's small enough to fit in a cup holder, but powerful enough to blast through tough ingredients like ice and frozen fruit with ease. Blendjet 2 is whisper quiet, so you can make your morning smoothie without waking up the whole house. It lasts for 15 plus blends and recharges quickly via a USB-C cord. Best of all, Blendjet 2 cleans itself. Just blend water with a drop of soap and you're good to go. With over 30 plus colors and patterns to choose from, there's a Blendjet 2 to complement just about any style. I absolutely love the Lisa Frank edition. What are you waiting for? Go to Blendjet.com and grab yours today. And be sure to use the promo code ANALYTICS12 to get 12% off your order and free two-day shipping. No other portable blender on the market comes close to the quality, power, and innovation of Blendjet 2. They guarantee you'll love it or your money back. Blend anytime, anywhere with the Blendjet 2 Portable Blender. Go to Blendjet.com and use the code ANALYTICS12 to get 12% off your order and free two-day shipping. Shop today and get the best deal ever. All right. Welcome, Major Logan Phillips to the podcast. How you doing, Logan? Hey, doing good, brother. Good to good to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to see you. You know, we met in person. Now we're doing this virtually. So right. it's kind of the opposite right. of how these things work. But um, it was very it was really nice to meet you. And I think we hit it off. And um, I'll, I'll let you get into, you know, who you are and stuff. But I think after reading your book, I kind of understand why we hit it off a lot. So I'll let you introduce who you are and and let everybody know what you do and know what you've been working on. Hey, yeah. So um, my name is Major Logan Phillips. And, I, and before I start, I always have to give the the preface that, you know, none of my yep. views um, are that of the government. You know, they're, they're my personal views and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yep. So um, I have been an active duty army officer uh, for about 15 years now. So I graduated from West Point, uh, married my wife and classmate the day after graduation. <laughs> uh, and so we entered the engineer corps. So I was a, a combat engineer for last 10 years. And then after my company command, I made a, a switch. So with dual military, it was really hard uh, with the kids. We just had our second kid. And I got this very fortuitous, uh, serendipitous phone call 
from a guy. And so my undergraduate was in physics. And so it was the head of the um, nuclear and counter WMD officer branch at the time and uh, sort of gave me this opportunity. So I, I ended up switching to a functional area. And so I've done that for the last five years now. Gosh, at this point, it's been it's been like eight years. Uh, <laughs> the year went down. <laughs> right. I went to Yale. Uh, I got my master's degree in physics and another in electrical engineering. And then I went back to West Point and I taught uh, physics uh, there. And that's where this other journey started. So I'll pause and say, I after West Point, I, I came to D.C. and I work at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and I'm a, a nuclear planner there. So um, doing nuclear science work. So on the side, though, in my extracurricular life, um, while I was at West Point, I had really gotten into the the idea of leader development. And at one point in my career, I was a basic training commander. And that really was a foundational experience that I, I absolutely loved transforming uh, young men and women. And then going to West Point and, and doing it again, but really diving into the leader development and pedagogy and all of that. So I, I got really uh, passionate about that and began the process of writing a book that was originally intended for just the cadets. Uh, that project over the course of several years has grown and grown. And uh, we released uh, my second book, actually, but this one, Number Your Stories and Lead Like a Legend. Uh, so that released about three weeks ago. And that's where we met was at the Military Influencer Conference. Uh, and it's been an, an amazing ride. So we hit number one on Amazon uh, in three categories. I'm still the number one new release, uh, which is amazing, man. It's it's super great. So a lot to dive into there. Uh, you have a great audience and, and I'm excited about sharing my experience and, and uh, going wherever we want to go. Yeah. And so I, I do think that this audience is going to eat this, that they're, they're going to love this. Um, you, you talk about a lot of great things and, but you, you mentioned, I think kind of just in passing how you uh, were a commander of, of, at basic training. Yeah. And that's one of, I think it's so my opinion. One of my favorite stories that you told was, a story from that command. And, uh, and so I want to ask you about that. It's about a, a young man that had gone into basic training by the name. I, I can't remember if you used a, a, a different name or if you actually used the name, but you went by private Brown. And so without taking too much from the book, so I want everybody to, to go get the book and, and read it and, do what I did. It took me about two days to just go through the the book. It's incredible. The stories are are amazing. But kind of go through the story of Private Brown. Yeah. So um, Private Brown, we, you see a ton of people coming through basic training. So right. I had I had the opportunity. I was a commander for about two years, um, and so you you get to see all the types, and eventually you start to be able to group them together. And there's a lot of you know there's the Call of Duty guy, and there's the uh, Billy Badass, and or the I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I came here. Or the anyway, a lot of my dad's a colonel kind of guy, right? Uh, and then there was this kid who Private Brown, and it, it's a pseudonym. It's not that's okay, not, um, but he he showed up, and he was different than anyone else we'd ever had, and so uh, he was this huge dude. I'm talking, I mean, like. I'm a big dude. I, you know, like this guy towered over me and, um, he looked like Hodor from the, from game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so he was never spoke. He always just walked along and, and he was almost impervious to anything the drill sergeants were doing. So I, as you might expect, there are a lot of you guys from, and gals from, uh, experience are, are used to basic training and everyone's running around and the drill sergeants are screaming and you're, it's very high paced. And this guy is just walking and nothing faced him. And so eventually, you know, and I'll fast forward a bit. Eventually we find out this guy had been, he was homeless and had been severely, severely abused from the time he was a, a young boy. And so he had 
uh, run away from his foster parents who had been abusive. And I'll pause there because I know, you know, I know a lot of people who are, are a gift from God who do fostering. And there are so many amazing, nurturing, loving people. God bless them. His experience was not that. And so, um, he had run away and, and like lived under a bridge and was eaten out of trash cans and was, um, you know, very much like a, a wounded animal, you know, it, it, what you would see in a, in a runaway kind of dog where he, he was so, uh, battered and, and traumatized that it really affected him. And so as a leader, we're trying to figure out, Oh, what do I even do with this guy? How did he get here? How do we break through to him? I am not a therapist. You know, I've got a company to run all, all the things that you would imagine would be going through your mind. Yeah. There's this like dichotomy of the needs of the army and yeah. the needs of a human being. Yeah. That's, a, that's tough for a leader. Absolutely. And you know, we, we talked about it. We struggled with it because certainly there was a voice of cut him loose. He's not our problem. We have all these other people and I get that. And I absolutely see that point. I also, as you said, see the point that, you know, this, this is a, a fellow child of God who is, is making their way through the world and for once in their life, maybe has a chance to have someone care about them. And so balancing those two things at the leader, and there was a lot of, I get into the, into the book a little, but there was a, a lot of conversations back and forth. And ultimately I made the choice to, all right, we're going to keep him through red phase, which is the first phase of basic training. Right. And then uh, we're going to have to reevaluate. And if he doesn't pass red phase, we got to cut him and he'll get recycled to the next unit. And then almost certainly not make it after that. Um, and so we're really trying, trying to flex on him to get, to get him up to speed and go through the process and the, the way that we're supposed to, but give him a little extra love. And at, at one of the last events, we had this powerful moment where uh, he finally let down his guard a bit and asked, asked about, you know, how, how do you do it? How, how are you confident? How do you get through this? Uh, and we were doing the rappel tower. So it's kind of a scary thing. And I'm used to people freaking out a bit, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think everybody freaks out. I, I remember being on the rappel tower and, and as I'm reading it, I'm kind of thinking back to my time at, at basic training and I'm going, I, can I even remember what I felt? going off because right. I can remember the after of it, which is like, this is the most amazing right experience for you. I love that. I had side note. We had, you know, by the time I hit it, literally thousands of people go through. Uh, and I'd always make, I was big about not just the rappel tower, but going down the wall on the side, the oh yeah the rope wall. And ev I never had anybody fall. And everyone, I'm going to fall. <laughs> no one fell. You know, you, you find the strength. But so, so Private Brown, how do you do it? And so I'm, I'm trying to give him this rousing speech of, oh, well, you, you got to have faith in your equipment, Private. You know, we've, we have this special equipment and, and faith in your training. We've got, we've been working with you and we've been doing this for everybody else. Faith in yourself. You know, thousands and thousands of people have done this before you. Uh, but at the end of the day, have faith in us. We, you know, we are your family and we're going to make sure that you're squared away and, and you're safe and that you do this. And it, he looks up with tears in his eyes and he says, I've never had a family. Wow. Yeah. And, and the guy who was acting as my first sergeant, best. I mean, I had so many amazing drill sergeants. This guy's one of the best NCOs I've ever met. And he heard what was going on. He runs over. I mean, this dude's like, a steely eyed killer. Yeah. <laughs> and he runs over and puts his hand on private Brown. And he goes, you got a family now private. And that, that changed this man's life. I mean, he, he walked up, went down the tower without a word, not an issue. Um, and he was never great. You know, he was never the fastest or the strongest or the most squared away, but, but he was the most committed guy. I think I ever had go through basic training. I mean, he, he put his whole self into everything he did. Uh, and it, it was absolutely incredible. So that's and, the, and I think 
Right. That so I, I love a lot of parts to that story, but yeah. one of my favorite things is how you mentioned, you know, he was never great at everything. Yeah. He wasn't the fast he didn't become the fastest runner. We kind of look through the lens of Hollywood or or books, or, you know, fiction books, and we we see or we see a story a story like Rudy, which also has Hollywood moments where, where some of this stuff didn't even happen and we're reading through it expecting this great change that did occur. Yeah. But if you if you look at it on the surface, you go, Well, he just did what everybody else did, which was graduate from mm-hmm. basic training. But if you go to the beginning of that story and see he is the most incredible person that graduated from yeah. there. No, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, that's that was it. I, that's what I was going to say. Um, I, I was going to shift over to Cliff. Well, I view. Yeah. Go for it. I just wanted to. I just wanted to highlight something that you pointed out, and I think there's a broader context for your listeners too about um, so much of what we see today is the end product. It is the Instagram picture perfect. You know, the the hundredth picture that the you know, person's been selfie that the person's been taking and you don't necessarily see the inner struggle. You don't see all the stuff that's gone into it. Um, and so a lot of times when I talk to aspiring authors or people who are trying to make it in the military or just young leaders, they'll see something like, oh man, you, I had a number one bestseller. Yeah. That, that was a five year project. Yeah. You know, um, or private Brown, Hey, just some guy who graduated. You don't see the the million miles he walked through the desert to become that guy who made it. And so I, I just think that's really powerful. And I, I appreciate you picked up on it. Yeah, I I definitely did. It's uh, I, I was telling you before we started all this that um, it's one of the stories that when people see me reading the book over the last couple of days, they were... Um, Oh, you know, everybody wants to know, what are you reading? I haven't seen that. And that's the story. I think that's the story that jumps out at at people and probably gets people to, you know, go, okay, where can I get that book? Um, Because that's how I felt. If I was told that story, I'd be like, I want to read the rest of those. Yeah. And, And like I also said, you know, I'm reading, I'm like, oh, these are, these are great stories. And then I was like, well, it's called number your stories. Like, what was I expecting? It's going to be great, <laughs> great stories. Um, but, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up, though, about we we don't really see the work that's put in. And, and I say this a lot to people who are, uh, you know, I had a guy, and you might have heard of him before. We had a guy, Andrew Bustamante, who was on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he became really big. He went on Lex Friedman. Uh, now he's, you know, millions of followers and, and his business is doing you know multiple millions every year now and he looks on the surface like an overnight success but if you actually you know I, I sat down and talked with him and and we went over his life it was decades of work yeah and he put in the work to to get to there so and there are tons of stories that show that you were doing this the exact same thing and when I want to talk about years of work that you've put in and a story that I think really shows who you are as a person and how you were probably put in the situation with Private Brown. And you were the best one to, um, I wouldn't say fix Private Brown, but to achieve the right goal for that person. And it's a story you tell. I'll let you tell it because I'll just bastardize it. <laughs> But but it's a story that you tell from I, I it was middle school um either fifth or sixth grade oh oh yeah and so you wrote it so I'm I'm sure you're okay with telling some parts of this story <laughs> I am I am um so I guess I'll start by saying this story um came out during the second uh, second installment of how I wrote the book and so. I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of that more, but the short version is I originally wrote a very smaller version of the book for cadets. And then um, it had gotten picked up by a publisher. And over the course of a several year, several years, it, it grew into what it is now. Um, and so this 
story came out of a section where I had a different story. And uh, it's the the pirate gold. Um, mm. And so I had written that story before. And the more I dug into that story and, and pulled out some parts, the more I realized, actually, the story starts a little bit sooner. I thought, ooh, no, actually, the sooner... It starts a little bit sooner. So this is the first part of a section that really discusses how your past stays with you and, and overcoming that. So, um, the, the short version is, you know, as a, as a really young kid, I was this super skinny, skinny, wiry dude who, who, you know, bounced around. It was, was energetic and, uh, I would visit my grandparents a lot and they weren't the the healthiest of, of folk. You know, it was a lot of <laughs> gravy covered, uh, everything. And so I got fat. I was a little fatty little kid, you know, in that weird transition where you go from little kid to teenager. Yeah. And, um, I don't think I, I had never thought about the way I looked, you know, it was the, the innocence of youth and your, your, so pure and innocent, you just don't notice. And Grammy loves you, and you know. And I, I went to a birthday party that I was invited to. And again, this is I'm fifth grade, and it was this girl who I was madly, madly in love with as a as a fifth grader. You know, live your life together. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so I go to this birthday party, and it's at the swimming pool near my house. And so I was super stoked, and I go and. Um, her, I get there and I go to meet them and I can't find her, but there's this friend of hers who's there who, you know, she, as an adult, and I look back, I recognize and she lived a really broken, sad life. She had a really troubling home life. Um, but you, you see how, how that set the stage. So basically they, I got there and they were started making fun of me about being fat and in a, in a bathing suit. And I was very confused at the time because I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. And it was the first time I'd ever really felt betrayed and, um, or that I even considered the idea that I was overweight. And so that was a critical moment. And so I go through my response in the book and, um, but I immediately went home and just threw myself into like, I'm going to change today. Like the kid who went to the pool was not the young man who came back. And I think that's, that's a hard time in everyone's life. Now, whatever the situation, people face a time where they realize that they lose some of that innocence. They realize that it's not the picture perfect every moment that, that you're broken, the world is broken. And how do we overcome those obstacles? And so that was the, the thing that sparked me on this journey that I cover through several chapters of, you know, getting into powerlifting. And, you know, I, I did very well in football and sports and in high school and in college. And, um, I have won a bodybuilding competition and, uh, and then even later on in life, letting that finding a way to let that go. So I suffered a, a really severe injury that I account, uh, which, which makes it so that, you know, I, I lift weights. I'm, I fulfill my obligations as a, as a soldier, but I won't ever, I won't ever compete like that in bodybuilding. I won't ever win another powerlifting competition. Um, so, and being okay with that, seeing how, seeing how, what, fulfilling your purpose uh is all about do you think that kind of so what happened there being made fun of and and kind of and how i see it is you you had two choices you could complete completely break down lose faith in all of humanity and yeah just not do anything or it motivates you to do whatever you want to call it be a better person um you know change your physical body your you know change your your mind your spiritual uh all of those things and yeah. i think that puts you on a trajectory of, of where you are today and it's put you in places that you tell these stories about maybe you don't see it but i can see it through the stories of had that tragic 
thing and it is it's tragic it's trauma it'll it'll be something that'll always be there um had it not happened your life may have taken a different pathway and, and you may not have changed the lives of other people um and in order to do that you had to change your life had to change and that was the moment um that was the moment that it changed amen brother you know something i have as i've gotten older tried to appreciate is being grateful for those moments being grateful for those hard moments cuz there are opportunities to grow and forgiving not the time <laughs> i was not forget forgiving and and i wrote i wrote that girl's name on a piece of paper and put it on my mirror and i looked at that piece of paper for years i mean like like high school years and you had and to see her every- yeah every day and I, I think i had moved past that and like i said i was i had a, a very good high school career athletically and academically and i was very blessed um and so i had moved past that physically by a lot um but deep down that little boy was always there now you had mentioned private brown and I think a big part of that has to do with the environment that I was in and the parents that I, you know, I, I was raised by two loving parents in a very uh, religious and uplifting home. And so I had a sense uh, of spiritual well-being and and that I was made for a purpose and and all of that so that when I faced that obstacle, I was able to, to shift and grow as opposed to um, being overwhelmed. Right. Yes, yeah, so a lot of times you know, we all I can say for a fact everyone has a trauma. Yeah. In, in their life. Um I don't care even even myself I look back on my childhood and and my wife and I have have talked through this a lot. She's really helped me out to to bring some of this to the surface cuz my life was like, well, I had a pretty simple life. You know, I didn't there wasn't anything that really went wrong i had some of the same stories that you have i was a fat kid in middle school got picked on a lot but i did have a friend group who was also the chubbier kids and you know i had my days that i remember fondly but i have the people that i also did the same thing happen i was motivated to yeah to be better yeah in in multiple sense and so it peeling back those layers really is helpful um it it happened to me over a couple of years where I peeled it back and, and really what's come to the forefront for me is the word grace. Mm. And it's a, for me, that's a very powerful word. It's what I try to explain to people is, uh, and, and I've gone through this like philosophical change and, and read stoicism and things like that. And, and really it, thinking about when you're hurt, when somebody hurts you, how do you react and the best way to react? And, and so I tell people, show grace, you know, yeah, you don't know what that person's going through. But then I also tell people, give yourself grace. There is going to be moments where it happens. Sometimes I feel like it happens every day. I just am triggered with something and go completely off the rails. Yeah. And you can dwell on that for weeks and totally lose the sense of who you are. And And so I've learned to say, Give myself grace. I've made a mistake. Be better. Be better today than you were yesterday. Your your only competition is with the person that you are. You have to be better than who you were the day before. You know, giving yourself grace, as you said, and and forgiving and moving past. One of the reasons why I went back to that place in the book was because in the story about winning the bodybuilding competition. And really that's a story about goal setting and overcoming some of the issues that, that I get into. But, but as I reflected, I recognize that that was one of the, one of the reasons why that was so important to me was to prove those kids wrong, to prove to myself that like that kid who I used to be, wasn't who I was. And I was going to do everything I could to kill the memory of that little weak fat kid that I used to be. Um, And then in a later chapter, I discuss how, you know, in this, this injury. um, So I I had a full pec and bicep tear um, shoulders and stuff. So I reconstructed surgery side note. Anyway, 
<laughs> I had to, this is completely replaced and, and everything. So, but in that story, I, I get into how working out is good. Exercising and being healthy and pushing yourself to your limits and growing is good, but it's not good when you're doing it with hate in your head. Yep. Um, when you're doing it to try to prove someone else wrong and to sort of vindictively do those things when you're running from a trauma or running from those, those memories, that's not healthy. That's not helpful. Yeah. Um, and finding a healthy way to embrace. Yeah. I want to be fit. You know, I want to do good things. I want to look good in my bathing suit when I'm out there and taking my pictures and do a lot of stuff. Uh, but it's not for validation from others. It's not to prove others wrong. It's because I want to be healthy with my kids and I want to set a good example for them. Yeah, I feel that uh, I had do those same thoughts in my head. Yeah. Of, uh, you know, there was a time before and I it worked with special operations and yeah. I saw those guys and I was always, I'm going to be in the gym with those guys and, yeah. and do all this because I want to look like that. And now going in on going on 40, and I'm just going, I need to, to move around because uh, yeah. I watched my father just basically disintegrate and die because he didn't do anything. And I don't want that. I don't care about that for myself. If I was alone and I didn't have anybody, it wouldn't matter. I could just lay in bed all day. But I have people that rely on me and, and like care that. about me. And so I appreciate that those points in the book that you make. And, and what I really love about it is we're in such a divisive culture globally. I and mean, just yeah. go go put it, go on social media for five minutes and try to not be angry about something. <laughs> it doesn't happen. But you you kind of go against that in the book. And it's you know, it's basically show show love and compassion to people. Show compassion to yourself. Don't let those traumas make you angry. Let them motivate you to be better. Yeah. And so what I want to get into is how do you write a book? You know? <laughs> so you've got all these stories and, and it's put together yeah. so well. You can see the trajectory through all of the stories. So how does that come about? Well, thank you. I, I think, well, first off, I learned in grave detail how not. <laughs> um, and so I... I first wrote the um, I Love You More, and that's that's the topic of a whole other conversation, but that's a charitable book that I started several years ago uh, where we give all the money to, to Gold Star Kids. But it's, a, it's just a silly um, book about a father and their son. It's not explicitly military. Um, and I self-published that to begin with, and then later ventured out. I recognized, well, this isn't going to go anywhere if I... If I'm, I'm the only one doing it, I need a little more support. And so I found, um, a, a hybrid publisher, uh, and I learned the ins and outs of that and they were valuable in their own way. But at the end of the day, I ended up with several hundred books in my basement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was kind of back where I started. Can and you so, kind of explain the hybrid publisher? I know we talked about it oh, while we yeah, were in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, sure. So um, for anyone who's interested, I think this is a valuable discussion and, and please reach out to me more um, offline and I'm happy to go into it in grave detail. But uh, self-publishing, there is no barrier to entry. You just go to the website and you load your material and they will print anything, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> uh, and for under 10 bucks, you can have in your hand a copy of your book. Yay. That's awesome. But you're alone. There's no support. There's no marketing or production help or whatever. You pay on demand for the book and then it'll show up. And, and it might show up on Amazon, but if no one knows, I mean, there's a gazillion things on Amazon. If you don't know what you're looking for, but this is what it is. Right. Um, and so the hybrid publishing is where Okay, now they have a team of, of some editors who can look and provide support in the design of your book and maybe cover art and um, illustrators if you need it. And they they can be there for the post 
rollout strategy that like they'll sell you a marketing strategy and then for additional cost they might do some other services but um ultimately you are owning the risk in that they're going to print the books and you are going to buy 200 500 a thousand copies of your own book and then you're out there like uh will smith in the pursuit of happiness trying to sell copies of your book to whoever will buy them and and at the time i really struggled with that now I've, i've since made some connections with folks and and have had great success and it's amazing uh and we're we're really grateful to be able to to give that charitable workout but um it was much later when i oh and let me let me talk about the third level of this which is what everyone thinks of when they think of book writing which is uh, traditional publishing and that's how number your stories came out absolutely traditional yeah, yeah. um but a little bit different and I'll, and I'll touch on that so yeah. when when you think of publishing you probably think of like penguin or random yep. house or like a big publishing firm and to get into a traditional publisher usually you need like a literary agent who who costs several thousand dollars or um maybe you have like a million followers on instagram already and so um or you you have are proven quantity where you have several best-selling books but the the chance of just sending your manuscript in and having one of those you know huge multi-million dollar corporations going ah yes this is the manuscript and we're going to run with it that is challenging right uh, to, to get it enter into those areas and so I, I was lucky enough to make contact with a boutique traditional publisher named uh, ep house and they so they're in a smaller independent organization but they are a traditional publisher and so they offered all of the other uh resources they offered marketing and publicity and connections with folks uh they gave me training for podcasting and and how to how to write uh, so that was just a, an amazing experience um so I said my first step was learning how to not write a book. <laughs> that was that was the first version that I wrote for my cadets. And so um I was seeing if I had it next to me. I have a, the version that I gave to them and I self-published it um because I wasn't selling it, it was a gift. Um and I hit my camera. Um <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, so I mean it was a gift and I probably wrote, it was 30,000 words ish. And I wrote and deleted that book probably five times. <laughs> yeah. So I was so scared about every word I was putting on the page being the perfect word and exactly what it is. Cause when you tell a story, it's living, you can go back and forth. You can change it every time you talk about something, but when you write it down, it is so final. Yeah. It's scary to commit yourself to that, that I, I really struggled and, and it took two years to write those 30,000 words. And then, uh, through a fortunate series of events that made its way to EP house and they reached out to me and picked me up. And, uh, that process was so much better (laughs) with, with a team of editors, with coaching, with people who knew how to work in that space. So I, um, over the course of about a year went through, it went up to the biggest thing was not hitting the backspace. And so they gave me some advice and and guidance. And so I went up to about a hundred thousand words, uh, on the manuscript. We then edited it back to 60 and then I built it up to 80, which is what, what it's at now. Um, and so, but I, I wouldn't have had the know how to do that on my own. Now, now here's, that's, that's great for anyone who's interested in writing a book. And I'd love to talk with anybody more about that and share my experience. But I think where that's powerful for your listeners is, you know, a lot of us are either in the military community or, or transitioning or, and you say how I could never possibly do that. I mean, I, yep. I'd like to do that. I, I want to write a book or I want to start a podcast or I want to be a chef or a a construction guy, whatever it is. But I mean, that's not me. I, I don't know how to start and recognizing that there is a community of people out there, especially for the military community 
who who genuinely care about helping you. And so things like the Military Influencer Conference are amazing because you go and you meet awesome people like you and you share your story and recognize, I mean, you know, me talking with you about publishing and sharing my experience and you sharing your experience with building this amazing podcast and connecting people together, um, you know, lifts all the boats. And, and there's so many opportunities out there just waiting. You just have to start, reach out and ask somebody, you know, the hardest part, the hardest part about writing was putting that first word on the page. Yeah. And just sitting down every day and saying, my, I didn't have a writing goal for the day except for one word. And I said, every day I must write one word. And that one word would turn into pages. And yeah. then it's, ultimately it'll, you know, it'll transition to, to a lot more. Yeah. And, well, and I like what you, step. I like what you said there about, um, you know, whatever you want to do, yeah. whatever it is. And, and I was told this story of being, being in Iraq and, and I was, uh, with army SF and, and look, I mean, if you just look at me, you go, that is not an SF guy. No, I was a support guy. Um, but, but yeah, out here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, but I got to know these guys and, and they're incredible people. And, you know, over the course of the deployments, we, we get to talking and stuff. And I mentioned to one of them who's the RTO, he's the radio guy. And we were into the same music and, and liked all the same kind of stuff. Um, and I just told him, I said, dude, I could never do what you have done. I could never go through the Q course. I could never complete my training. And and he looked at me and he was like, well, yeah, you've already told yourself you can't do it. I promise you, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Yeah. And And I thought for a second and I was like, yeah, I have already failed myself because I've told myself I could not do it. But that brings like, this brotherhood, that community within the military, that's like, there is, there are always somebody that wants to help you. And throughout all of our military careers, uh, there are stories like that you have in this book that say the same thing. When you're at your lowest, we're always picked up by someone else. It's, it's what you told, you know, what, what the, the first sergeant told Private Brown. Well, hey, hell, you got a family now. Yeah. And that, that's what it is. And so, you know, you say number your stories and I say, find your family. That mm. That's a lot of what you show throughout the book. Yeah. And the comment that you made about talking to that um, SF guy, and I, I totally agree with the idea that, well, yeah, if you shut yourself down, you're never going to, you're never going to make it. You have to have, I can in your heart. Go out and get it. Joe Dirt. Yeah. But, Joe uh, Dirt. <laughs> Joe Dirt. But another important point is, and I, and I talk about this and it's about who are you measuring yourself against? What does success mean? I, I'm, I don't need to be the best. I want to be the only, I don't, I'm never going to be David Goggins. You know, that's just yeah. not, that's just not me. Uh, but I have a lot to offer and you do too. You know, whoever that I, I've worked like you, I've worked with guys on the other side of the fence and they're awesome and we're buddies and they crush it. And I chose a different path in my life. I went into this science and teaching community and uh, focus on that. And there are times where you you go, man, shucks, I'm, maybe I missed that opportunity. But, or you, you meet people and you're like, I don't know if I could ever be like that. I try to be the best me, you know? And, and a lot of the book, really the, the biggest theme in the book is respecting the person, the life that God has gifted you and, and paying attention to that and seeing what, what have I been gifted and how do I make, how do I use that for the betterment of the world around me? Um, and so I don't, I don't have to be the, you know, three-star general. I don't have to be the David Goggins and, and all those guys. I have a special set of skills and I'm just going to keep honing my craft and getting better at those things. So I think as long as you're getting better in the way that you can, that counts. That counts. Yeah, it's it's definitely true. Um and and it just it it goes for everything, right? 
And and I just I just love what you say about it's something I, I said before. You you only have to be better than who you were yesterday. Boom. And and I think a lot of the divisiveness that we have with other people is is sort of this jealousy thing. It's the constant pursuit of unattainable perfection. Correct. That's a, that is exactly what it is. Great quote. Um, and it goes back to what you said on social media. You know, we we see these yeah. perfect curated lives that that other people are having and it's people we don't even know right yeah so it, it's exactly that reason so i i read it a lot i think you you've got to read professional literature um it's it's just a part of being a leader and right. so i i kind of see those like vegetables you know you just got to chew through them sometimes because <laughs> they're not all great you know, yeah, they're, they're they're kind of boring sometimes. A little dry, maybe boring is not the right word, but dry, but super important to our development. And again, not all of them. Uh, Phil Clay has this amazing book. I, I'm not funded by that, but I just really love redeployment. It's it's fabulous. Um, but but in it, these guys are or they're at the pinnacle, sort of talking down, and it's it's very rare to see the fullness of who someone is. You see the wizard of Oz. You don't necessarily see the man behind the curtain. And so for a lot of people that can be really disheartening because all they see are these picture perfect images of, you know, the great, the great leader, uh, the perfect decision maker. And they don't, they don't see the, the guy or gal who's just figuring it out, who's, who is nervous, who's, who's using the information at their disposal to make the best decision. And maybe that decision was wrong and they learned from it and they grew. They don't see the little kid who is, is struggling through those issues from years before and now trying to make their way in the world. So I tried to be as authentic as I possibly could in this book and really dive into some of those areas that, you know, this is, this is really me. This is what I thought. Uh, This is what I struggle with. Some of the decisions I make are bad. And I recognize that (laughs) later on, some are okay. Some are like with private Brown where you're like, I have no idea what the hell to do. Like I am really fumbling the ball in this situation. And thank God I had my first sergeant to jump in and, and save the day and make a big difference. But, um, I think that's important when you talk to people is, is don't try to put on a show, try to be, try to be honest. And that, it makes a big difference. Yeah. And there's, I do think there is a lot, especially in, and your book is on leadership and telling your stories, um, in, in order to lead, but the way that you do it is authentic, as you said. And I do think that a lot in this leadership culture, we, we see a lot of inauthenticity, a lot of people that maybe even lie about their stories to, <laughs> to put themselves up. And and so it kind of gets I down. I didn't do that. <laughs> well, the, the leadership culture kind of gets gets put down a little bit, which is why I think, you know, everybody should go out and get, get the book because it's more based on not, you know, be this great leader so that you can be great and make all this money. It's be a good leader because there are people out there just like you need people to lead you. There are people that need to be led. And it's this quote, uh, and and we're talking, we were at the military influence conference. I was talking to the publisher and, and one of these, I was telling her one of these quotes and, and it harkens back after reading the book. Now I can say, okay, you would get this as well because it's a, it's a Churchill quote. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. says, um, if you're going through hell, keep going. Keep going. Right. But what Churchill fails to tell people is that you can't just keep going alone. Yeah. You have to be pulled out of hell and you need a leader to do that. You know, it, in my life, it was my wife that did it for me. I'm a completely different person for the better now because of things that she did for me. And so your your book shows that a lot. That's what I really love about it. Thanks, brother. It means a lot. Yeah. I, I've been very blessed to, to have a support network, but also to know that I'm never alone. Yeah. You know, I feel, I feel that presence in my life all the time. And, and I try, 
I try to share that with folks as much as possible. So now to we'll shift it, but yeah, it's kind of a shift, but going back to what what we were discussing, yeah, what yeah. we we started to get philosophical. I'll say, <laughs> his, <laughs> those yeah, are the best kinds, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's a shame we're not smoking cigars and and drinking some uh, some brown. Next time, Next we, time, yeah, we will definitely do that. We've got a few places for that. Um, so what I wanted to ask was now you mentioned yeah. kind of briefly that it was kind of fortuitous that the publishing agency got your book. Can you kind of talk through how that happened? Um, yeah. And, and led into where you're at right now. So, um, I had sent, uh, it was actually through, uh, the first book. So I, I had been reaching out to, uh, some charitable organizations about that. And, um, one of them was connected with, uh, some, some folks that I knew and people at West Point, uh, who I had taught with. And so I had sent them a message, this charity, uh, and, and it kind of disappeared and I, you know, no ill will, they're busy. And I was asking for a handout really. And, um, fast forward like two years and I got this out of the blue email from them and said, Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I know this woman, Kristen, and she's the CEO of the, the publishing company and she could probably help you with that. And so, um, I got a hold of, you know, got in contact with them and we got to talking and then she came across this other book I had done and she was like, Hey, what, what is this? I said, Oh yeah, that's, that's this other, this other little thing I, I did on the side, but that's nothing. It's, it's not a, something I'm really trying to push. And she goes, well, you should, <laughs> I really like it. And so I think at the time I, I was very insecure about the idea of why would anyone re want to read this? I mean, my cadets do because those are the stories that I would share in class. So at the end of all of my physics classes, here's the dirty secret. I don't really care if they know physics in 10 years. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I, I'm there to make leaders, not physicists. And so we use physics as a as a tool to do that. But that's that's the means, not the ends. And so um, I would share these pivotal moments in my life at the end of class and have these discussions. And time and time again, the cadets would come back and be like, "Man, this was so powerful." And I really they never talked about conservation energy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they always talked about the private Brown or whatever. So, um, but I, I didn't think anyone would be interested in, in picking through it other than that small group of cadets. And so, um, it was really cool to, to have her sit me down and say, Hey, I've shared this with some people. If you don't mind, here's the feedback I'm getting. I really think there's a market for this and, and guide me through that. So that, that was really great and, and helped me to see past myself in the moment in a way that I, I didn't think possible. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well coming up on time here, don't want to take yeah. too much more yeah. of your time, but I do, first of all, I want to say everybody go out and get the book, number your stories and lead like a legend, oh. major Logan Phillips. Um, but you got to tell everybody where they can get the book. And then I wanted you to tell everybody what you're working on. Is there going to be another book or we're going to have, number your second stories. What, what are we looking at here? What's the future for, for major Phillips? Absolutely. So, uh, first off you can, you can get the book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. There was a brief time where we actually, right when we went on, we sold out of the stock. So we had, you know, which was great. Uh, I think it's a good problem to have, but we have since replenished with the, the printers. So that's fully available on, um, on an ebook and in the, on the paperback version, uh, in the coming months, we're having a hardcover printed and, uh, we're interviewing folks for the audiobook to come out in the near, say near future, probably six months. Um, awesome. but go get your, get your paperback version. Uh, you can also find me on social media, Logan Phillips author. Uh, I have a website, Logan Phillips Uh, and you, and I really genuinely mean this, Email me, email me, logan.phillips.author at gmail.com. And so, you know, I'm busy. I'm a full-time army officer. Um, so 
but it, but it's important. You are important and I really care about helping you on your journey as well. That's what this is all about. So reach out to me and I will get back. Yes. What's next? Um, yes. So I actually start a PhD program pretty soon. So, uh, I go to physics, uh, get my PhD in physics, excuse me, uh, PhD in physics. Then I'll be returning to West point to teach. So I have, obviously my dissertation is a uh, primo on the list of things I need to be doing. Yeah. Uh, but I'm working on a, a series of fiction books um, on the side for young adults, which more will be coming that in the near future. And then in the short term, I'm developing a, a podcast and then really getting into a lot of the conversations that we've we've talked about with how do we how do we help folks navigate this space transitioning from um you know, their time in the military to whatever. So many people, so many people I talk to have a story to tell and just have no idea how to do it. And they feel alone and they feel like they have something important to say, but they don't know how to say it. And so I've really gotten passionate about helping people find that voice and figure out how to get their their message out there. So that that's really what's coming up for me in the short term. Awesome. We'll be on the lookout for, for Major Phillips. I, I think I told you in Vegas, if you don't start a podcast, that would be the dumbest thing <laughs> not to do because in how the interactions and, and I think everybody hears it, hears it now. There's someone, yeah, you can be well-spoken, you can do all these things, but bringing that energy and having those stories to tell are, are really what makes it influential. Um, and so I hope you're going to take the, I hope it's going to be on, on leadership and leading young military men and women you know, especially people transitioning out of yeah. the military and leading them to be the the great citizen soldiers that yeah. that we all can be. Uh, man, Logan, thank you for your time. I uh, love the conversation. We're going to have to have you come back on here pretty soon. I know this is going to be a really popular episode. Heck yeah. I appreciate you, brother. God bless. Have a good one. Have a good one.